Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Burns, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly online event where we cover anything that may be of interest to librarians, um, any activities, topics that may be of interest to librarians in Nebraska and across the whole country, actually, now. Um, we do these sessions, um, these are free sessions, free, last about an hour, every, and we do them live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time. Uh, they are recorded, though, so you can go to our website and listen to any of our recordings of our shows if you want to, if you're not able to join us on Wednesday mornings. And we do a mixture of things here, presentations, book reviews, mini training sessions, interviews, um, just anything. If it's library related, we'll put it, put it on the show. Um, once a month, we do a Tech Talk where we bring on um, Michael Sowers, who is the Technology Innovation Librarian here at the Library Commission. Good morning. He's sitting here next to me. And he shares some tech news of them over the last month, um, since the last time he was here. And he sometimes brings on other people to interview, talk with, whatever. And mm -hmm. as you can see, we have that today. That's not Michael up there um, that you're looking <laughs> at at the moment. Um, but I will hand over to Michael and let you uh, take over right. and introduce what you're doing today. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, like as Krista said, my name is Michael Sowers, and I do the Tech Talk episodes here. And um, it, I, what, even once a month, I got to say, I, I, I need to give Krista kudos because she finds pretty much somebody to to, to be on this show every for week other weeks, yeah. for all the other weeks, three, three out of the four uh, weeks, or sometimes four out of five weeks a month. And and sometimes I have trouble finding people uh, ahead of time uh, just for my one episode a month. But about two weeks ago, when, when uh, a whole bunch of travels were done, I realized I, I didn't have anybody for this month, and suddenly I got a new follower on Twitter, and I was like, hey, I recognize that guy's name, <laughs> and I remembered watching his presentation at Computers in Libraries this spring, and I thought that it would be a really great topic to uh, share with our audience. And little did I realize that he's actually got some uh, new projects going on that I, I think he's he's going to talk to us about today. So, uh, Aaron, that is that is you we see there on the screen. Good morning. Good morning. And you are with uh, BookLamp.org, and I'm sure we will get to that shortly. But why don't you start out by just kind of telling us a little bit about yourself, your background, uh, where you're coming from. Sure. Um, always kind of a tough question, actually. So, um, so my name's Aaron, obviously. Um, uh, my background is in what's called industrial organizational psychology, but uh, my passions growing up was that I wanted to be a writer, an author. Uh, a lot of what we're going to talk about is actually the result of um, a childhood dream at 14 years old, kind of combined with computers over time. Uh, and um, about 2007 or so, founded a company called BookLamp.org, uh, and also known as the Book Genome Project. And uh, we've been working pretty diligently since then um, out of New York, uh, Boise, and then uh, we, have, we have some people down in, in um, well, they're moving around a bit, but down in California. Okay, so what exactly is BookLamp and the Book Genome Project? All right, so, um, yeah, it's interesting, by the way, I'll, I'll leave this off by saying that, uh, that um, I'm a better conversationalist than I am presenter, so what I'm really hoping happens is that about five minutes into this, anything I have to say that's pre-planned will kind of be derailed by some sort of interesting question or conversation. But, um, so BookLamp uh, is actually kind of the front end of what we call the, the Book Genome Project. And so while, while we actually were founded, uh, the Book Genome Project was originally conceived of back in 2003, um, but uh, the analogy works pretty well, kind of the Pandora.com for books. And the analogy um, connection, and like you see, this is the, the book genome logo. The analogy connection is that, that like uh, Pandora, which pays attention to the individual components and metrics inside of a piece of music, we do the same thing with books. Uh, the difference is that we use computers. So, for example, um, what we'll take, when we look at a book, we'll take uh, and break it up into scenes or chapters. Um, and then we'll look at each individual scene or chapter for a combination of things like writing style, uh, and then thematic metrics. So, for example, when we look at a book, um, you know, traditional bisect categories are very binary. They tend to say, well, this book is either about vampires or it is not about vampires. We tend to be more granular. We can say a book might be 5% about vampires or 15% about vampires or 50% about vampires, and those are very three different types of vampire books. Uh, we also pay attention to more subtle themes. So, um, 
a vampire book is 5% forests and uh, is very different than 5% urban environments or 5% you know, castles and medieval environments. So, um, and then we also look at the stylistic. So, you know, is, is the, look the rise and fall throughout the book, things like pacing and density and descriptions levels, dialogue levels, things like this. And then at the end of the day, we try to pull that together into a coherent um, statement. So it says, if I like this book, I would be interested in finding another book like it. Okay. Is that, 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 is that a reasonable description to start off with? Sure, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that, that, that sounds good. So, okay, so you're, you're analyzing these books. I guess my first question for you would be, where are you getting the data? I mean, the, right. the, the raw, the texts, where, what, what's your source, where, mm -hmm. how is it, so how does that work? We, we've worked with publishers. So uh, about a year ago, we launched bookland.org, uh, which is kind of the, the, the technology administration, the tool set. And, what it's, it, and then we started to go out and connect with various different publishers. So we have somewhere between 60 and 100,000 books in the corpus, um, depending on uh, which books we can make public based on our relationships at any given moment. Um, Actually, I'll go to the one of the one of the slides here. Comes an excellent. It's a good example that we use a lot for describing kind of what we do. So this is a screenshot of, of the Bookland.org website, um, and uh, picked a book, the DNA from a book that is fairly well known, the Da Vinci Code, right? And so when we look at the Da Vinci Code, we don't see a book written by Dan Brown um, that's a bestseller, that's well reviewed. What we what we see is a book that has language structure that is, is third person with fairly typical um, uh, writing style metrics with a little bit slightly higher pacing than most books. But then in the story DNA, we look at the themes. Uh, you know, it, it's made up of some percentage of history, academics, culture, some percentage of Catholic institutions, religious hierarchy, um, communications technology, art and art galleries, secrets and secret keeping. Um, so it, it gives you an idea that at the book level, what we're trying to do is say, okay, if somebody handed the Da Vinci Code to us and uh, said, I liked the Da Vinci Code. We do not try to measure in any way qualitative good or bad. That's, that's, I think that would be a very risky thing for computers to try to do. But quantitative things like how much is this book about each individual theme. Uh, if we can find a book in our database that is written with a similar writing style, a uh, similar thematic, I mean, uh, stylistic thumbprint, and has a similar distribution of themes, the chances of being relevant to the reader to at least look at are pretty decent. Um, and kind of because what I'll do, I'm going to do is I'm going to throw things out there and see what seems interesting to people to talk more about. Part of the reason we do this is because there's a, a metadata problem. We call it the social void, which is that there are lots and lots of the universe, and the vast majority of them don't have enough reviews, don't have enough uh, metadata around to adequately classify them. Um, and so they tend to be invisible in the social network. Some of the books that I grew up with as a child you know, um, that were my favorites for the child. Uh, now, currently, if you look at the social discovery systems, don't have enough votes to be qualified as being uh, recommended very well. And so this is a problem that's growing, right? But the advantage is that we have as much information about Harry Potter as we do about, um, uh, you know, an author that's published their first book yesterday uh, is now the system, or a book that's five or six years old and never have a good marketing like Um, so, I, I'm trying to phrase my my question here. I mean, I there, there's so much here, and I, I've got like all these questions, and and I'm, I'm finding this 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 really cool. But if 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 I may focus just a moment, so you're saying that with with the publishers, they they just they they give you a dump of the text. Is is that I mean maybe a little more of the back end? How how does this actually sure. work? Let's get a little technical for a few minutes. Sure. Okay, so uh, you know, to start off with yes. Well, we basically our, our basic uh, primer for the system, I guess, would be that the text of the book, right? In fact, we're actually kind of a proponent of um, an oddly odd perspective in the publishing industry today, uh, which is that one of the things that's hugely influential to how well a book performs in the market or how well somebody likes a book has to do with the actual written language and thematics and content of the, the book by the you know, put there by the author. And while I say that seems like an oddly, an odd, odd perspective to have, it's only the context that for some reason, a lot of times in publishing nowadays, uh, you'll find people who become very jaded um, that, that 
what drives the sales of a porn soap book is entirely based on how big its marketing budget is, how well known the author is before it's published, uh, and, and so forth. And so we, we, we start with the text and basically say what we're trying to do is connect, uh, you know, this book will introduce another book, its, it's friend. Um, from a technical standpoint, uh, what we'll do is, yeah, we'll approach a publisher, and, and the value proposition for them is really pretty straightforward, right? We don't offer positive or negative reviews of a book. We don't um, bias against or for a book. We just simply say, if your book is in our system and somebody is looking for uh, themes that are like your book, we'll, we'll surface it and recommend it to them. And we're very backless friendly because we're not uh, subject to the pyramid structure that a lot of the metadata concerns are. And so we're basically an alternative discovery mechanism that's, that's, that helps promote a different genre or demographic of book than most publishers have an easy time doing. Um, from a technical execution standpoint, um, so let me, I'll talk a little bit, for example, around like, you know, density as a language complexity measure, right? Because what we quickly found out is, um, while my background is in writing in English as well as psychology, we quickly find out that the, the, the definitions that people use in lingual discussions uh, vary quite a bit from person to person. And so we kind of just find our own operational definition of density and pacing as we thought it best reflected and was useful for a reader. Um, and, and, the, and the reason for the complexity of this, by the way, is that you not only have to come up with measuring the book, but then you have to figure out how to take all this data, and I think there's 30 some odd thousand points of data we measured per book, and then boil it back up to a way, that, to, to a, a measurement that is actually useful for somebody, for uh, somebody who's actually looking for a book connected to a real thing. So density, for example, is a complex, uh, is a complexity me measure for language. Uh, it deals with some of the obvious things like compound sentence usage, com uh, com you know, vocabulary breadth. Um, but there's also a lot of elements in there that, that um, are difficult on the surface for a human to look at and say, I can see why that has to do with, with uh, density. The reason why is because the way that we define each one of our metrics is we, we define what we're looking for, and then we have humans go through and identify what we consider to be exemplary, exemplar uh, you know, good versions of whatever we're looking for. So uh, a really good uh, set of high density scenes and then a whole bunch of low density scenes. And then we use machine learning and, and look at the actual strength and structure of the language to see what are the consistencies between one group and uh, different with the other. What it basically is trying to do is say, um, you know, if you're taking a computer and trying to train it to guess what it thinks a human would think, it, that if a human had read this, this scene, this chapter, and um, and had perfect knowledge of all the millions of other scenes we have in the book, we, the, the average human would probably say that the scene is more dense than 85% of the scenes in the corpus and less dense than the remainders. Uh, and that's what 85% does to the scene. Did that answer your question? Sure. Yeah. No. No. That that's good. Um. And and it's leading me. It it's leading me to kind of a, a another related question. Um. And it, it sounds like I'm focusing on publishers, and I don't mean to, because I know we'll get to lots of other things. But I was <clears throat> reading an article recently about how, with with the advent of eBooks, publishers are getting a mm -hmm. lot more data about how and what we read, sure. and it, it's starting to influence. Um, what they publish in in the example being that it we tend to or people tend to read uh, nonfiction in short chunks so they're starting to publish more electronic nonfiction in smaller doses as opposed to really mm -hmm. long books do do you see obviously the publishers would get something out of your system along the lines of helping to sell books in that people who like this book might like this book but mm -hmm. do, do you see possibly the the amount of data you're gathering from the text maybe influencing the publishers in other ways? Um, well, yes, yes and no. Um, so if you're right, there is kind of a shift that's going on in publishing. And, and we spent the very first uh, portions of our company, the first two years at least, uh, working very hard to figure out how to, um, how to work with publishers uh, with their data uh, in such a way that they felt comfortable and were willing to kind of move forward with a relationship with us. And that's been a lot easier in the last few years, partly I think because we've been around longer, but partly because publishing in the industry in general, I think, is starting to, to understand how powerful and useful this kind of data can be. Um, I certainly hope that we are able to, uh, to improve the, on the way things are done now in, in publishing. For example, I've had numerous 
editors tell me that um, that it is not unreasonable to to you know to acquire purchase and to acquire edit and then publish a, a book which they think will sell a thousand or two thousand copies if they know not to print ten thousand copies and if they know if the cost of finding those one thousand readers is not exorbitantly high the problem is, is that we don't have enough information to easily find those one thousand readers so let me pull up another slide I'll give you an example of this um, so this is a um, infographic that we kind of threw together at one point in time because there's, there's information that we can drive from them from the book database we have that while they seem like average easy questions are really very difficult so when you ask somebody in the publishing industry how long is the average book traditionally what they'll tell you is 100,000 words now you're talking about short short form uh, there's other changes around in the industry that influence this but if you look at what materials are being published today and made by the mainstream publishers um, they're correct. The average book length is 100,000 words. But if you use that and apply it across all genres, it's, it's, a, it's a very poor measure, right? So, for example, what is interesting is that the average romance novel in our corpus is about 76,000 words long, right? The average historical fiction is 117,000 words long. Um, but this one down here, I think, is more interesting too. What is the most common perspective, right? Is it a first-person book or a third-person book? And you can do similar things about by, by you know, past versus present tense and so forth. And what I think is interesting here is, is romance, right? Because what this is basically saying is that 90% of the romance novels published on the market generally today are third-person books. I said, or he said, she said, and only about 10% of them are first-person books. It's a pretty heavy bias. In fact, it's a bias towards third person in every category except for biography and autobiography, where the first person becomes more prevalent. Right? Now, in terms of your question about how, how, uh, what does that mean in terms of finding, of using that information to help find and publish materials that is able to find the right readers? If you are a romance reader who likes long form, meaning more than 100,000 word romance is written in the first person, you will have an extremely difficult time finding that book. If I'm an editor who gets a, a manuscript coming in the door and I love the book, I think it's a fantastic book, storyline and plot, and all the things that I judge a book on are good, but it's written in first person uh, and it's, and it's 120, 30,000 words long, I'm going to have an uphill battle to try to convince my publisher to actually publish that book because the market for it is not really well established. It's, it just means that it's it's, it's, it's against the stream of what the typical romance genre has been historically. But if I can help you find the 1,000 readers that really, really like long first-person romance, if that's something that they trend to, then, then you can open the door to a whole category of books that otherwise wouldn't have been publishable that, that now might be, because you don't have to, you, you can kind of accurately picture how many books should be in the rent run, or if it's talking about digital format, that's not a problem. Um, but also the cost of finding those people might not be as high as it used to be. And so I think it actually, I'm hoping, and you compare that to what's, what's done currently, which is that um, you know, Fifty Shades of Grey becomes a, a wild success and suddenly the amount of sexual content in, 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 uh, in romance all climbs because the, the, the whole flood of books that kind of fit into the same category. So um, I'm hoping that we can actually we can help diversify the market by helping people with very specific tastes, find the publishers publishing books that are very specific. Okay, here here's potentially an uh, an easy one or two. Um, uh, how many titles do you actually have in your database right now? And are there any? And if you don't want to name names, that's fine. Are there any um, publishers or books you wish you had in there that you just you haven't been able to get a hold of yet? Um, I won't. I won't name names. Uh, so we have between, like I said, it depends on on the, the timing. Uh, but we have between about sixty thousand and one hundred thousand at any given point in time, um, and that's from most of the major public. You know, we're working with content from most of the major publishers at the moment. Um, there are always there, there's there's a, I'll answer that question two ways actually. So there are always publishers that we're looking forward to working with more, and there's also publishers that we wish we were serving better. For example, one of the areas that that I think we can be the most helpful for it because we're a, a neutral platform for discovery, meaning that we don't bias towards marketing budget. Um, a lot of the independent smaller publishers uh, who are having trouble competing on the market with, with uh, larger entities are fine, you know, it, we can be friendly to them, but we don't have a mechanism right at the moment that allow them easy access. We don't, you know, our, our pipeline is, is 
in terms of how we you know, how do we interact with publishers, how do we make friends, how do we bring their content in the system is, is slower than we'd like. And so as we go farther on, I'd like to, to better at helping to serve the publishing community by you know, broadening our spectrum. Now let me, let, me give you a, let me give you an example of what I mean when I talk about friendly to the backlist. So my, my, favorite, my favorite story uh, for this is one I've used a long time. Are you, are you familiar with um, uh, the name Richard Bachman as an author? Oh, yes, I am. Yes, <laughs> okay. of course. So the name of Stephen King, right? So uh, the story, as I remember it from reading, I think it was the introduction to, to the Bachman books or whatnot that he was he published, was that uh, at some point in time, Stephen King's friends were telling him that they didn't think in today's publishing world he could re-break into the market. Stephen King, being Stephen King, would be kept out because of how much competition there was or whatever the metrics were, right? And so he decided he would want to test this, and so he took some of his old books that had never been published, and he, he polished them up, and he published them again as, as, under the nickname, uh, the pseudonym of, of Richard Bachman. And he wanted to see whether or not Richard Bachman could re-break into the industry. And as the experiment goes, if I remember correctly, there is a, he, he, does, he posts about five books, I think, under this name, and they do okay. By his fifth book, I think he's selling 30 some odd thousand copies, um, and... Uh, he said, I remember he went on record saying that he was doing better as Richard Bachman by his fifth book than he had done as Stephen King by his fifth book, and that he thought he was on the right trajectory. Then somewhere along, he was, along the line, somebody found out, and it became public. And then the Richard Bachman books went from respectable sellers for an independent to Stephen King style bestseller, right? Now, so one of the tests that we had as we were building out the system um, is if, an author, if a reader said, I like Stephen King, the best recommendation possibly given to a Stephen King fan would be Richard Bachman. Right, prior to everybody knowing who he was, Stephen King. It is, it is a uh, a very very comparable author, right? So one of the tests was whether or not with our system we would find those connections. And one of the, the big wins for us is after we built the initial system, we had I think at that point about seventy thousand titles in the system, and we went through and I looked at Thinner by Stephen King slash Richard Bachman, and was very pleased to see that I think four of the top ten books that came back out of uh, out of the seventy thousand were Stephen King books, which means that that even though Richard Bachman was not as popular an author as Stephen King, uh, that the day that that book had reached the market, like as of the day, or even two weeks before the release, if the book had come in your system earlier, the day it reached the market, we could have let our Stephen King fans know that there was a new author that was in the market that might be appealing to them, like Stephen King. And it didn't make a difference whether or not Richard Bachman as a new author had hundred thousand dollars in the marketing budget didn't make a difference whether or not he had a lot of metadata surrounding his own name. It was a way to pull out something from the backlist fundamentally that would be appealing uh, to somebody who also liked the front list. So that, that's why we talk about it being very neutral, very friendly to the backlist. It doesn't bias in that way. Yeah, that's a, that's that's a great start. You know, I, if if you pull up uh, Stephen King, will I recommend Richard Bachman? The other way around? Uh, I haven't. I mean, it depends. Actually, so. This is, a, this is a double-edged sword on this story. Stephen King's actually an extremely diverse writer. Uh, you know, there are writers that are not diverse. Iris Johansson is a romance author who is very, very consistent in the way she writes. Um, Stephen King actually, if you, if you, you know, you look at his catalog of books, some books will uh, be very similar to others, you know, uh, and some books will be very, very different. It, or The Stand, is a very, very different book from uh, Dolores Claiborne or Cujo, right? And so, yes, you will find uh, books recommending each other, but um, uh, but they will cluster in different ways. Um, you won't find all the Stephen King books recommending all the Stephen King books. You actually will find it recommending some sets. Sure. <coughs> sure. Um, also, if, you're, if you're pulling that up, I think there's actually a, a – and I noticed this morning, I think there's a metadata error where for some reason in the system this morning, um, uh, the author attribution on Stephen King is a little funky. I'll have to look into fixing that. So. <laughs> yeah, you better get on that. Um, yeah, so uh, kind of now maybe um, switching a little bit towards the um, kind of the, the, how a librarian end of this, uh, or librarians could use this as opposed to the publishers. Um, mm -hmm. Just especially looking at, at the charts that you have up here now, it's, it seems that, you know the majority of it is genre genres in fiction obviously but then you have like biography and autobiography is mm -hmm. your database skewed heavily towards fiction or uh, or not it would be kind of the first part of the question the second part of the mm -hmm. question is is do you find it harder or easier to deal with fiction over nonfiction or or the other way around in, in this sort of system 
Uh, no, and so um, I was actually, you know, so I'll reference some other things as well. Just uh, I'll come to that in a second. To answer your question first, no, it's, you know, it was originally built from, from a fiction standpoint. And the reason is pretty straightforward. Um, if you look at nonfiction, it, nonfiction is very well built for viewer style analysis. So if I'm trying to find a book on programming in a Perl programming language, a keyword search is probably going to help me find it, right? The problem is, is that a lot of those style metrics are not very well structured for fiction. So if I'm using Stephen King's example, if I'm trying to find a book like Stephen King's if what keywords do I search for? It's a it's a tough question. I mean it's a um, you know like monster or horror. What you end up doing is searching by genre almost more than you start in search by the specifics of the book. So we built it, um, kind of stylistic and subtle theme analysis for, for book discovery. Uh, uh, was really initially intended because it filled a hole in fiction recommendations. That said, uh, we found it worked very, very well for nonfiction as well. You know, if you look at, to the extent that if you look at cookbooks that are French cooking, what you'll find is you'll get back other books that are French cooking cookbooks because um, because the, the common references and thematic ingredients they tend to use are very similar to preparation methodologies. If you look at a cooking book that intermixes story with the, the recipes, which is, is fairly common, you will find other books that intermix stories and recipes because the other the additional themes that tend to show up in the, in the story elements of the book um, uh, will draw those cookbooks closer together than other cookbooks that don't have stories. Right. So no, it's not intended for one or the other. In fact, one of my favorite things to do is uh, the, the, the switch you can do on the where you can say I want to see only nonfiction or or only fiction. Right. And, the, and that's the only division, by the way, we make in the actual um, in the actual display of the book. Like when you say I like this book, can you find one like it? We do not pay attention to the official bias actor genre at all. We simply say if it contains, you know, an equal amount of magic and equal amount of vampires and put them together that, that probably probably is worth you looking at, even if it's not labeled as officially the same genre as what you have, what you traditionally read. Um, that said, what we do separate out is is fiction versus nonfiction. Um, so we will Show if you search for a fiction book, we'll turn return a fiction book. But you can turn that on. And so, um, for example, you can. I remember I was reading a book that had a lot to do with military campaigns. Military. It was a fictional book uh, about um, about combat space or something of this sort. And which is there is no nonfiction book about combat. There's very few nonfiction books about combat space. But it had themes that were military and so forth. And so I was curious. I said, okay, I'd like to find all the nonfiction books that have themes like this, this fiction book that I read. And what I came back with were nonfiction books about training in military. You know, uh, it was about special forces team, and so I came back with current day special forces books. And so it's like the ability to kind of switch. So okay, I, I've never read this fictional piece of this. I wonder if there's information out there from a nonfiction perspective on the same topics. And so you can, you can kind of bounce around from one genre to the other very fluidly. So um, this chart that you're showing right now is the one I remember from your talk at CIL. I, I, explain this, just because mainly because I, mm -hmm. I I love this chart. <laughs> and and do you have this for like okay. so, every book? I mean that that's kind of the follow up. We do, right? So every single book we analyze, we generate. I think I, I think I mentioned. I think it's thirty two thousand plus time points of data for every book. And what that means is that every single scene we looked at, we measure a whole bunch of metrics times every single scene in the book. And um, and so it's 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 one thing when mm -hmm. you look at the at the uh, at the high level thematic metrics of a book and say, okay, yeah, I can see that the bench code might have some religious hierarchy in it. But the other thing is to realize that because you're doing this with a computer, you can know as much information about the very first chapter of a book about the, as the second chapter, third chapter, and the twenty seventh chapter. So uh, uh, there's two things you can do that. One is stylistically you can do things like measure writing style. So for example, what you're looking at here is Jurassic Park from Iowa Crichton. It's an also one it's also one that we use a lot as an example because people didn't be familiar with either the book or the movie. And this this graph is actually on the back of my business card because I, I love it. Um, Jurassic Park when I was younger used to be one of my all-time favorite books. And you can tell very quickly kind of I buy a school science fiction, fantasy, uh, and then business and so forth books, my reading habits. Um, the but I remember telling my friends when I was younger, I used to say, uh, you know, you, you have to read Jurassic Park. You have to read it at least halfway through because somewhere in there, like, it's the most action-packed book you've ever read. And um, 
And then, so when we were building the system, the question was whether we'd see that transition. So what you're seeing here is, uh, is the density and pacing graphs for Jurassic Park from the beginning of the end to the end of the book. And what you're seeing is at the beginning, when he's talking about, he talks about, you know, the science of cloning, he talks about security systems of the island, uh, right? There's a lot of setup here. And this is a fairly typical science fiction profile, meaning that the, the density level is fairly high, the pacing level is fairly low, moderately low, and, and so forth. And then, and then the dinosaurs escape. The fences get turned off, and dinosaurs start eating people and, and all that jazz. And, um, and what you see is that Michael Crichton in his writing actually shifts there. What happens is the density falls, so the language structure becomes less complex. Pacing goes up. Um, and, and it stays that way throughout. Now this, this is a very typical uh, action adventure profile. And in a way, what Michael Crichton did is he took a science fiction profile at the beginning and merged it with an action adventure. And you can see how an action, in, an item in the a character or a plot event in the story influenced the way that the, the author structured the story. So a few other things. The one, this is very Michael Crichton-esque, right? Uh, you will see this kind of a pattern with other books, but it, to have it last, you know, 45 percent into the book is is a long time. Michael Crichton gets away by doing that much, much more than most suspense authors. Um, the other thing is, is that you see the same pattern. Though I don't, though I don't have it up here. You see the same pattern with dialogue. Dialogue falls off here. Um, the funny way of saying that is that you know, after people stop talking as much after they get eaten by a dinosaur, uh, that's probably not actually accurate. What, what really is is the dialogue a lot of times is used as a pacing device, right? You move pace forward very quickly um, by you move the plot along by having people tell tell or talk about the plot. And um, so here, there's probably a lot of dialogue to the setting scene and explaining a lot. And then after after the action adventure characteristics kick in, the need for dialogue is supporting maybe uh, supporting structure in the story is less, and so it falls off as well. So now I'm wondering what the pacing looks like for a cookbook. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't have I don't have the ability to pull up. Uh, I mean, we do have this data, but I don't have a graphing tool built for it that can pull it up. But I will show you something else that's, that's interesting. So another thing you can do, um, because you can measure on a scene by scene basis for uh, interactive themes. So you can say, I want to know where the werewolf is versus where the vampire is versus the werewolf, the werewolf and the vampire exist together, which gets me and moving towards something else that I want to talk about in a bit that we're working on. But what you're seeing here is is a sexual content graph for Fifty Shades of Grey, which I assume that most of everybody is familiar with. Um, and what this is basically is, again, beginning in 1,000 word increments, going through the book and scoring the book for its amount of sexual content. So Sea Shades of Grey actually goes for a long time with very, very little sexual content. Um, and and uh, you can graph out and see exactly where it's taking place. In other ver you know, for some comparisons, this is a sexual content graph of you know, Letter of the Penthouse, <laughs> um, which, I mean, speaks for itself. What's more interesting to me is this one right here, which is technically an erotica book, but it was published as an erotica book in 1906. So the definition of erotica in 1906 was a very different de definition of erotica in modern contemporary times. And you can see the change. Um, now, by the way, just so you know, what this kind of information is useful for actually is a number of things, but primarily what we use it for is um, metadata verification, right? Does, you know, does this 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 book is published and you know, has metadata in it somewhere that says it's a juvenile fiction book, but yet it looks like Fifty Shades of Grey. Is it possible this book has an error in our metadata? Right. Um, you definitely don't want to be recommending this book to a child because it's got content that's probably not appropriate to it. Maybe we just got a, a data cross somewhere and lined things up incorrectly. Mm. So I'm I'm afraid to ask on on these last three charts some of some of the um, areas have little stars in them. Um, what what do the yeah. stars mean? <laughs> Star, stars mean if you were if you were a quality control person and you're trying to figure out uh, does the metadata of this book line up with the the genre. So let's pretend that it's not Fifty Shades of Grey, which we all know. Uh, pretend, pretend that it's not. A children's novel, which means that any basic sexual content would probably play it for, for review. Um, let's say it's a it's a mainstream book um, that looks very much like it has a profile that, that matches erotica. So you're saying, okay, I don't know if we accidentally screwed up the bisect label on this. 
coming in. Um, what you want to be able to do is check the, the, the three most prominent sexual content scenes in the book to get uh, basically its extremes. Um, and so that's what the, the stars uh, measure. And in internal systems, you can link these, right? So you click there and it'll pull up that particular scene. Now, it's also interesting about this, uh, and we, we think about other ways you can use it that are more broad. Um, we can do this sort of an analysis on any of our themes. So if you want to see where the dragons show up in the book, or where the vampires show up in the book, or where the cooking shows up in the book, um, you can graph it out with a similar sort of methodology. Also, and then you can put the stars where you have vampires who are fighting, right? Um, or uh, space exploration that has combat, or whatever it might be. I, I, my references tend to be genre specific, and so I don't want to leave you with the impression this is only a genre-based tool. It's just that my reading habits and my frame of reference tends to come from a genre background. I, like I said, I used to, I have a pride in Robert Jordan, Orson Sack Park, the people I grew up reading. So, gotcha. So, um, one one more question here about um, a hey, book lamp, and and then we'll 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 move yeah. on to your new project. Um, mm -hmm. So there there are other systems that do the, if you've read this, you might want to read that, so, and we won't name names. Mm -hmm. why, why should we use, why would a librarian maybe want to use your system instead? Um, well, the, you know, first off, we do not claim to be perfect. I think it's really important to realize that what we're talking about is a different way of protocol discovery that is complementary and not competitive to social recommendation engines. Um, there are things social recommendations engines do very, very well when there's enough information. And there's uh, things that social information and recommendation engines do very poorly when there's not enough information. So we, we kind of, I see the future of recommendations being a hybrid where it lends the strengths of one system and the strengths of the other. Uh, case in point, um, you know, so there, if, if you look at like Goodreads, uh, which I really like, I very much enjoy Goodreads, it's a, it's a fantastic site, um, or, or Amazon's people who bought this bought that, because um, I don't see a reason not to name names. I think they're very interesting systems. Um, well, what you find is that, that books that are popular recommend books that are popular. And, and we oftentimes forget how large the social void is. Um, and, and again, the social void, from my definition, is any, any book or item that doesn't have enough social data around it to be recommended. So if you, if you look at like Goodreads recommendations, um, and I've done this with my own site, and I don't, I'm not, I'm not, like I said, I think Goodreads is fantastic, and so I don't want to use it as a, as a, um, I use it as an example just because it represents one of the largest book dedicated systems out there, not because I think it has major flaws, but it represents what problems do exist in social discovery. And so if you, the, a, way, a great way to test and get an idea of how large the uh, social void is, is, um, is to look at your own recommendations on Goodreads. So I don't have any reason to think my experiences are different from the other typical readers. I've, I've gone in and put lots of books in Goodreads, and then I went back and looked at my recommendations, and they're decent recommendations. But what I pay attention to is the number of votes each book in my recommendation list has. And I went through and I counted how many books in my profile had more than 100 votes, at least. And um, I actually was curious, and if I went down, I recorded uh, 800 some odd recommendations, and I counted exactly how many of them were. And what I found is that Roughly 95 to 96 percent of the books that are being recommended had 100 votes or more, which means that there was a lot of metadata on it. What that said to me is that is that the recommendation engine that the Goodreads is using uh, is probably looking at and saying, well, we think we give the best recommendation if we have at least enough information represented somewhat comparably as 100 votes or more. They might not be using the exact metric, but if you if your book has zero votes, uh, we probably have a very difficult time recommending it because we just don't know enough about it. It could be a good book, bad book, we don't know. Um, in comparison, if you actually go look at the content on Goodreads, uh, depending on how you estimate it, it's, it's, it's likely that, that probably in the range of 95 to 99% of the books uh, with, with reps in their system have less than 100 votes, which means that, that those books are, I speculate, but I believe those books are largely invisible. And whether those numbers are exactly the spot or if it's a little lower than that, it's in there somewhere. So at some point in time, a book just does not have enough metadata in order to be found. And it's a much larger category of books than people realize. So um, the question is, is when you have, you know, if you have 500,000 votes and reviews on Harry Potter, you have plenty of data to figure out whether or not somebody likes it. 
the other goal that's got 500,000 votes is plenty of data to be able to cross compare and say, would somebody like Harry Potter like this new book? What lacks is if that if you have 100,000 votes about Harry Potter and you have zero votes about another book would be a good match for a reader who likes Harry Potter. We just have no judgment call. We just have no way of pulling it out. And so at that point, so there's low metadata areas. What can we do to help make those authors discoverable? Um, if you are Richard Bachman, how do we make you discoverable to fans of Stephen King? Um, because Richard Bachman would have been a low metadata area. He would not have, I mean, especially his early books, would not have had 100 votes um, on, on Goodreads. So uh, it, it's, it's exploratory. There's, and, and there's a number of things you can do also uh, with, when you, when you look at a book and you can say, okay, this reader tends to be reading books of these specific subgenres uh, or sub-themes inside of a book, it gives you a very interesting, unique profile of them. So the, the, the strength and the weakness of, of Bookland is that uh, as long as we book and as long as we have a single reader, the system is equally effective as if we have um, or the book, if you have a single reader is as effective as 100,000 readers. We don't have a cold start problem where we need to gather a whole bunch of data about every single book. And in fact, we can gather data about data book, books once we have the text file much, much faster than the social recommendation agents can. And um, so really you, you, you have to kind of look at the pros and cons of every system. And, and uh, you know, in some areas we do very well, in some areas we do very poorly. We don't have the book in our system. We do very poorly. We also cannot recommend a book, excuse me, if it's if we have no data on it. Um, and and sometimes we do fantastic. We do Richard Bachman to Stephen King match or the uh, you know Dan Simmons Purian matches. Or but sometimes also we get really weird ones. I mean um, we call them zingers where I I look at the thematics and I don't know what the end is doing. It's just a training book to me. And I look at it, I'm like you know that just doesn't make sense. The lists this book and that book aren't really very close. Um, and and that, so another example, another I think is, is interesting. Um, so if you look at the, I don't know if, it, if it's still this way, but it used to be if you look at the shared bookshelf methodologies on library things and looked at uh, library thing and looked at um, uh, the books that were similar to Harry Potter, or no, to Memoirs of a Geisha. Um, what you find comes back as a comparable, meaning inside of inside of the, the as, as being shared on a lot of people's shelves, is the Da Vinci Code um, and a Harry Potter title. And at first, when you see that, you're like, "Wait, why doesn't make any sense? Those aren't anything alike, except that all three of them are released into the movie theater in the same summer. And so the marketing budgets of the movie releases drove people to buy those three books all together at the same summer. And so they show up on a lot of people's shelves together at the same time." It's not necessarily saying it's a bad recommendation, but it's a pretty clear example of where marketing budgets outside of the quality of the book or the content of the book is driving why these things are put together on the shelf. Wow. <laughs> yeah, and, and the moment you said Go those ahead. three books, I said I said movies. I, yeah, so that was that's good. Um, we just want to remind everybody that you know we're welcome to take questions uh, from the audience. Just go ahead and type them into the Q and A area, or um, say hey, turn on your mic. Um, so when I first asked uh, Aaron to um, do this show, this is what I was uh, thinking we would talk about. But then he said, "But hey, I've got this other project uh, that's that's coming up very shortly uh, called uh, the Game of Books." See, I, I wonder where you got that from. Um, so why don't you tell us about that? What what what's going on there? Sure. Um, so first, I I I, I want to make an appeal um, because. It's easy. It's easy uh, to listen to me talk about data behind books and make the assumption that um, that the what I see when I see a book is data. That's not quite true because I, I mean I very much grew up in in the reading environment. Um, the, the originally, the reason where this all came from was when I was younger. Uh, I believe I was about 16 years old and I wanted to be a writer. What I would do is um, I'd write short stories. And I'd give them to my father, and I would, I would have for editing, and I would require him. Makes you an indication of how weird of a child I was. I'd make him, I would make him uh, score every page on a scale of one to ten, and how interested he was in that that page. 
And the idea was that I'd graph it, and I'd go through, and if a page fell below a 7 out of 10, that was the page I had to edit. You know, something, so that's where the person gets up and goes and makes a sandwich. Um, but very much my interest in, in the things that we do are come from the fact that I lived and breathed books growing up. Growing up. You know, my very first job was in a library when I was like 12 years old. I used to clean it um, at a local library, and they gave me a key, and I'd go in at like 9 o'clock at night, and I'd read for an hour, I'd clean for an hour, I'd read for an hour, I'd clean for an hour. And I grew up with this. And so um, when, I, when I look around a lot and try to say, okay, what can we do with this sort of data? Uh, are, there, are there authors we can help who don't, are, are having trouble finding the market or people to read their books? Um, one of the areas that, that I, I have an insane want to try to work in is, is libraries. I, I have a very, very strong affinity of libraries. The second story on that kind of shows how, how unpopular and not dateable I was as a child was that on my 16th birthday, my birthday party was how my parents drive me from the small town that I lived in to the larger city that was nearby so I could spend all day in a bigger library. And that was my 16th birthday party. And um, that, that, that uh, is spectacular. So, <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, I, it, it's, um, you can imagine what my high school life was like <laughs> from, from that story alone, right? Um, so the, uh, the, this, this idea of libraries is something, is a mission that I really, really, really deeply care about. Um, and, and we always are looking for ways of helping people understand how our data can be useful or helpful or informative, a, a way of thinking about books in a slightly different way and discussing the process in a different way. And we're trying to figure out how to do this. And what we came up with is, is uh, this is a very preliminary graphic or whatnot, but we're, we're preliminary, we're calling uh, the game of books. And, and the, the, the appeal I want to make is that uh, I wrote up here, and you can't see it because of the shine up here, but my Twitter name is Aaron Stanton. Uh, at Aaron Stanton is my Twitter, and my Facebook page is facebook.com slash booklamp. We are very much interested in connecting into the library communication networks. You know, I, I, we have a fairly good relationship with publishers, with publishers and with authors, but um, we, don't, we don't have as much of a connection with, with librarians, uh, which is sad to me, first off. But also because the game of books is specifically intended to help libraries um, engage readers. Now, the, the, the basic premise is very similar to summer reading programs, right? The libraries already do, where, where students can come in and they have to read a certain number of books at the end of the summer, they might earn a reward. What we wanted to do was figure out a way that you could um, expand that a little bit. And uh, so the way it got started is very, very simple, actually, and kind of cheesy. We were sitting around the office, and uh, we were playing with graphs. And, and just like the sexual content graphs, we didn't know, we were like, well, let's put little swords and cross swords for combat scenes over this, this spot in the graph. And let's put little hearts for a romance. And, and it was kind of fun, but not very useful. Um, and, then, and also, there's a danger of kind of giving away elements of the book with these graphs, which is why we don't really tend to publish them on the website very much. But, um, what we ended up doing is somewhere along the line, something like, you know what would be fun is if a, if a book could earn a badge for having a really unique combination of elements. So the first one I came up with was what we call the, the Clunky But Cruising Badge, which is a book that has a suit of armor and a modern day car together in the same scene, right? Which is just a great, you know, why, you know, it's totally irrelevant, but it's a rare combination of events. You have to have a weird set of combination of events in order to get that to show up in a book, right? And so then we just kind of went haywire, right? We have uh, this this badge right here is Tough Love, which is a romance novel with a density score of higher than seventy five percent. I think this is the Armchair Detective badge, which is uh, you know, I'm trying to remember what it is. It's a police detective badge, right? So books that have high themes of these uh, of police detectives and some other uh, some other combination. Um, and and so the idea is very simple. The first part of the idea is very simple: is that if you read a book that contains a unique badge, uh, you as a reader should be able to earn that badge. And not only that, the, how valuable the points you earn for that badge um, is determined by how rare the badge is. So for example, the rarest badge in our entire corpus is a book called, is, is a, uh, called the Nerdy Vampires Badge, which is a combination of vampires and high presence with science, technology, and astronomy. And there's only like four books in the entire corpus that earn it, and uh, it, one of them is a, a book about vampires on a space station. NASA space station somewhere, uh, which I know about solely because it shows up. And um, the idea is to help discover, it help provide a reason to discover your book, uh, a book that's different than you typically read. So the book was built around basically these, these journey concepts. 
that you might have the science fiction journey or the romance journey, and you complete a journey by earning a set number of badges. Um, and so it might be you have to read the underwater cities badge and the time travel badge, or the time travel badge, or so forth, or the space exploration badge. But the point is, is that you you can complete the journey um, to earn levels, and you can get earned points. Finally, the the part that I actually is really really interesting about it uh, is that um, that because we want every single book in the system to be able to play, right? Um, you, but we want badges to be fairly rare and special. One of the things we also do is what we call reading experience points or reader XP, right? And what it is is if you read a book that has a specific theme, you earn points just based on how much that theme is present. So if you read a book with 15% vampires, you might read, earn 15 vampire points, right? And what happens is you add these together, uh, you fight, start finding you might become a level 5 vampire reader because those are themes you read over and over again across multiple books. So, for example, um, I went in, I, I read a, most of Tom Clancy books. You just go put those in. I think you earn like a level seven terrorism security reader and a you know level five um, you know a military conflicts reader or whatnot. And, and the idea is is twofold. One is it allows me to be able to um, very quickly kind of compare with my friend what levels. Two, from a reader advisory standpoint, is very interesting because I can go and I can say, listen, I like fantasy. But then I can show you my profile, and um, and you'll very quickly get a sense of whether or not this is a swords and sorcery fantasy reader, or is this a magical creatures, unicorns uh, fantasy reader, or you know what category of books does this person tend to gravitate toward, and also what books in the system have those themes. And so um, it's kind of a discovery method. Now the very final component of this is that one of the one of the tools for playing it uh, that I think is fun is going to be an iPhone app or an Android app. And uh, basically what you do is you sign up for a journey, and then you can scan the barcode on the back of the book or search for it and find it. And basically what we'll do is we'll show you the game cards of the book, which is what badges you would earn, the points you would earn if you, uh, if you were to read it. And it creates almost a scavenger hunt style where you get to go in and both interact with the digital, but also have a reason to go in and interact with the physical library stack as well. And there's a whole bunch of questions about how this sort of stuff can integrate on the catalog level and so forth. But we're very much interested in kind of collecting feedback and information from whether or not this would be useful for, for readers. I mean, like, uh, oh, for, for readers, specifically for parents or teachers or librarians who are uh, kind of championing the, the reading mission, if that makes sense. So um, one question based on something you just said, you, do you foresee, yeah. do you foresee some sort of way of integrating this into a library's catalog? Or did I mishear you? Well, that's speculation a little bit, oh, okay. right? I mean, because one of the I think to talk about libraries without talking about the catalog leaves a void in their hole in your conversation. Um, but that said, what we're doing, and the reason we're trying to connect to the library community is we're trying to put together like basically an advisory committee of of librarians, teachers, uh, maybe even a gamer designer or two to help us kind of make sure that what we build is, is appealing people. Um, and and, the, and what what we're trying to do is, is to work, make sure that the game has a, a number of criteria. But the primary one being is that it's useful, right? It actually fits into the way the librarian will interact or a patron will interact with the library. Um, the other component is is that that it, you know the library that I grew up with in Cascade, Idaho, which has a population of a thousand people, was very small. Uh, you know, it was it was two large rooms, lots of books, and a, a computer in the corner. Um, this is granted it was back in 2000. 1999, somewhere in that range. So uh, it probably has more computers now, but um, it was not. It did not have a lot of financial resources, and so it's very important to me that whatever we put together is something that can be played both by basically regardless of the financial resources of the library. That uh, Cascade Library, as long as there was access to the internet, um, preferably an iPod that access the internet that could scan the barcode or you could use to look up information about it, that that uh, there's not really a lot of material cost to playing. It's really a, a framework. It's a, it's a way of, of creating uh, a usable framework that people can plug into. And But at the same time, if, if, some, if a library really wanted to get into it and patrons really did respond to it well, that you could also support a much larger um, game uh, and, and encourage reading amongst the community if, if that's what the, the way it was supposed to go. So um, 
the exact design is, is almost deliberately at this point not, not nailed down because we really want input from the library teaching parenting communities. Oh, oh great. Thanks, Aaron. Um, we do have a question from the audience. Uh, Theodora wants to know if you cover YA, uh, young mm -hmm. adult fiction. And I assume she means in this. In is the it, game. Is it, can you repeat that? Actually, it's, it was a little quiet. My speakers are very terrible. <laughs> That's okay. No. Um. A question from the audience. Theodora wants to know: Do you cover YA, young adult fiction? So certainly, the game we're building it because it's to be a broad appeal. But uh, I think it's very difficult to talk about gaming and read, re gamifying the reading discovery experience without talking about young adult. Uh, fiction. I think that's probably the place that the most people will gravitate towards. Certainly, teachers and parents will certainly gravitate towards uh, young people. So, yes, and that will be a, a, a high priority. In fact, what we'll do is, um, so to explain, by the way, what we're going to do is, is we have the conceptual framework, we have the books we've analyzed, and we know what books are and what badges and so forth. Um, what we're now trying to decide is what kind of response we're going to get from people who might or might not actually use it. And so we're going to have a, I'm not sure if you're familiar with kickstarter.com, but it's a place where you can kind of propose a project idea and and people in the community can, can support it by pitching in $10 or $15 or, what, or nothing, just kind of voting to say, yeah, I think it's cool. And what we'd like to do is, uh, is if it, it gets traction there, is we will, we will tailor the game in a bit, a, a bit towards uh, so if that ends up being young adult, we'll make sure that we have a very, very good comprehensive coverage of young adult fiction and nonfiction that covers, um, you know, so that, that, that there's a very, very good chance that when you're, you know, somebody's in the library, young adults in the library trying to find out what kind of books to read, the vast majority of the books are there, all have been already, are, are already participants. They already have game cards in the game. Um, so yes, it's it's uh, that'll probably be our starting point. But I would be very, I would be disappointed with myself if we build a game that only appeals to young adults. Right? I would very much want a game that also can be played by um, people my age that that read, um, that use Facebook, that um, might be involved in book clubs where the curriculum, where the the, the reading list is helped is just partly derived. You know, you can see the book club, you've earned this number of points and things like that. All right, so you, I think you kind of partially answered this question mentioning mentioning uh, the uh, forthcoming Kickstarter campaign. But so, um, okay, I'll be honest. I want in. <laughs> um, you know, I'll I'll beta test. I'll do whatever as soon as you got an Android app. Um, so somebody is interested in in helping, playing, doing whatever. Uh, what should they do, and when should they do it? Well, um, so first off, I. And oddly enough, for a company and, and, and a team that's about to launch a Kickstarter project, I feel very uncomfortable uh, directly soliciting support. But um, what I am comfortable soliciting is is connections, right? Um, so first off, you can if you want to follow my my Twitter, us on Facebook, like us on Facebook. What I'll do is connect you in. So when you post on Facebook any updates about what we're doing, you'll be able to see them. Uh, if you follow me on Twitter, certainly I'll be I'll be vocal when when Twitter happens to when the Kickstarter launches to kind of let the word you know actively go out and introduce myself to people strangers on the street if I have to and say hey will you check this out. Um, the other thing is is that uh, I, I'm quickly discovering that there is a community that I've neglected to my own irrigation a little bit in the community in the library's community right so I'm, I'm going out and trying to introduce myself to different librarians and. You know, getting to know people who are who are connecting connected to this. You know, I, I love, by the way, I I just recently discovered the whole uh, superhero persona thing that's going on in libraries. The, the librarian in black, the the unquiet librarian, the you know, the these um, you have your own secret identities. <laughs> this is a this is a fantastic. I love this. This is a such a a, a wonderful library esque thing to me. Um, and what I'm discovering is that I'm really very disconnected from these communities, and it's weird because I'm trying to I'm trying to be connected. So, um, you know, let people know that we exist. If you think what we're doing is interesting, connect with me. Send me an email. Um, I'm uh, happy to, to put my email address somewhere that's available, um, uh, or send me a you know, follow me and send me a Twitter message or whatnot. Um, anything we can do 
to in a non-annoying, friendly, and and good-hearted way of getting a hold of and connecting with many people who might be interested in the project as possible is our goal. So. All right, fair enough. <laughs> Another question? Um, uh, or oh, comment? Well, no, oh. No, please. I was just going to say something. No. Um, yeah, just so everyone knows, um, as we do with all of our shows here, we put all links for any URLs that are mentioned into the Library Commission's Delicious account. So I've added the booklamp.org site, but I'm also adding direct links to your, the Twitter and the Facebook page as well, so people can quickly jump to and connect with you guys. And, and I just liked you on Facebook. So there we go. <laughs> <laughs> there Although I don't go. live on Facebook all that much. Um, so do we have any other um, questions from the audience, questions or comments? At the moment, if you have any questions, type them into your question section. We'll, we'll get them answered. Um, so, Aaron, I guess I, w I will just give you an opportunity here uh, while we wait to see if we have any other questions from the audience to uh, add anything else you'd like to add, uh, anything maybe I didn't ask you about you wanted to, to plug or tell people about. Uh, not really plug or tell people about. I, I, I'm looking at my um, my graphics. There's one or two other ones. If you're interested, I can kind of uh, sing just just because it's interesting stuff that we do. Sure. Um, so I don't know our time. Oh, our time is almost out. So do you want me to go ahead and continue, or do you want me to? Yeah. No. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, I, this is great. Okay, go so, ahead. All right. So uh, again, reflecting my fantasy esque reading behavior. One of the one of my favorite books um, growing up was the Wheel of Time series by Robert Jordan. Are you are you familiar with it by any chance? Yes. Yes. Yes, of course. And the fact that you just said yeah. while you were growing uh, up made you, us feel old. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, no. It, 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 the, the truth is, is that what the series has been going on for fourteen years, so everybody has read it while they're growing up. That's just yeah. the nature. <laughs> I mean, well, even even if it, if if uh, you came to it after school, um, <laughs> we still grew up while it was being written. Right? I, I I was I working at a bookstore when the so, first one came out, so that's that's why you made me feel old. That, anyway, that's great. <laughs> oh, well, I apologize. That was not intentional. Um, that's all right. I'll just leave it at that. I'm sorry. Um, the the uh, the one of the things that I think is very interesting about the Wheel of Time series, and I think people who have read the series will probably connect with this, or at least. Refer um, see where it comes from is that if you if you as you read the series the book get this the books change over time it, you know when it's being written over that period of time the authors tend to evolve and and Robert Jordan as he did uh, got more complex right and and um, his character use it changed so we also track things like how what percentage of scenes each individual character stand, appears in and so forth and so this is just a graph um, of of the see the book by book metrics in sequential order of the Wheel of Time in the first ten books of the Wheel of Time series. And what you can see is at the very beginning of the books, uh, you know, they start in the forty five percentile or forty five percent range, and then and then they get consistently more complex. Now in density specifically, a five point move on the scale is noticeable, right? I mean, if you pick up a book that's 20 and if you go to 30, it's a big jump. We also have 20 to 25 is noticeable. So, so, to get, so for to go from a 45% density to a 75 density is a tremendous change in the style for the writer. And um, I found this very interesting because, um, because, well, it reflected my experience. But the other question a lot of times is, is do, yes, okay, writing style is interesting, but does writing style really matter to the reader? And and this is a great example of it, of saying yes because another thing that happens is if you look at the average user rating for Amazon star ratings on uh, for books, um, what you find is that they go they start the series starts out fairly high rate, rated and then drops right the lowest rating I think was 1.7 out of five stars which is a very very low rating for a really successful book. Um, and what you're seeing here is a statistically significant correlation between the pacing level of what Robert Jordan wrote and the score that the readers gave it when they said, we like this, you don't like so this. So it was this saying is that the Robert Jordan fans were very, very clearly to read and not read. And, and so things like pacing and density and language structures tend to get overlooked in marketing campaigns. It tends to get overlooked in, the, in discovery campaigns because we, it's somebody with thematic makeup that connects two books. Um, you know, they're both about spaceships. Um, 
But at the same time, uh, that's not the only entryway. So I'm not sure if you're familiar with, with Nancy Pearl. Um, but Nancy Pearl out of, out of Seattle has a, has a philosophy that I like. Um, that is, there are multiple entryways, there are gateways into a book. And every, every reader, when they say they like a book, can be referring to one of several different reasons they like it. It can be language, it can be what it's, what it's, it's setting, or plot, it can be the characters. And, um, and we all kind of bring our own internal bias. When somebody says, I liked Ender's Game by Orson Scott Card, uh, and, and I assume that you like it for the same reason I do. I don't think that's necessarily true. So really the follow-up question has to be, what did you like about the book? And, and we try to, to, to eke that out by saying, well, give us three books that you think are similar that you like. And then we can look at what the consistencies are between them. Well, you think these things are, are similar and themes that are similar are these, but also you tend to drift toward the pacing level of this range and the density level of this one. And so can we find, use that information as well to help refine it for you a little bit? Um, so it was just another interesting example of I think how these things can interplay. Great, yeah. When when you brought up the the, the wheel of time charts there, Chris and I started asking about you know uh, tracking deaths in Song of Ice and Fire by you know uh, George R. R. Martin and things like that. <laughs> you know um, because you know characters just die. But anyway. Um, so we're not <laughs> not seeing uh, any other questions nope. or comments like from the audience. Yeah. Aaron, I want to thank you very much uh, for, for doing this uh, for us and with us, especially on um, less than two weeks' notice. Uh, we know you're, you're busy uh, running a company and things like that, so uh, we, we appreciate it. And Krista, and, do you have No, I was like, we'll definitely be looking out for that game of books. I'm going to get involved in it, too, and we'll share information about that when it is um, live. Yeah, you, you've got at least two people here who want to play, so uh, figure we can well, excellent. I, and, and for everybody else who might be listening, I, I w I'm serious, I really would like feedback on it. We, we, are, we are interested babes in the wood in an environment that we, we think we're just out there trying to do fun things that we would enjoy. And, um, and it's always hard to, you know, bring these, you know, it's always hard to convey our enthusiasm and our good-natured intent and then, and then how we try to translate that into execution. And so I really, really would, if um, you have thoughts on it or, or, or perspectives, please do send me an email. Um, I think one of my earlier slides had an email address, but it's astanton at bookland.org. Um, and fire, fire me an email um, if, if you feel like it. Um, it would be appreciated, even if it's, if it's just a, a one-liner saying, I hate this or I love it or I whatever it be. So please. All right, great. Aaron, uh, once again, thanks uh, so very much. Uh, we're going to go ahead and take control back for just a few minutes. I've got a few uh, news items that we want to cover here, so give us just one sec to uh, switch over. And we're going to set this up okay. Um, I just have two links I want to talk about. Uh, those of you who are regular listeners to Tech Talk, um, I... I I, I tend to talk about security issues uh, just a bit. Um, and, well, it's news. I mean, that, that's really what it comes down to. Um, one thing I won't get into too much, but over the last couple of weeks, um, there have been some significant security issues with Java. Not JavaScript, Java. Um, and I've even gotten questions at our recent uh, Tech Planning Summer Camps about that. And <clears throat> basically, the big question at the moment is, should I uninstall Java for my computer? Um, the general recommendation at the moment is, is unless you know you need it, yeah, you should probably uninstall it. Okay. Um, that being said, some of us do need it. I, How do you know if you need it? Well, if you don't know you need it, you probably don't. Um, <laughs> yeah. You can, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a hard one. I yeah. mean, I specifically know I have a couple of programs that do rely on Java to, to do things, but I use that program like every single day, and I know without Java it won't work, so... Yeah. I know here at the Library Commission they attempted that and it lasted for approximately 20 minutes, maybe 17, <laughs> before they realized, oh, wait, sorry, never right. mind, and had to put it back because I think people did rely on it for certain sure. things. So obviously on, it's something you'll pretty, know pretty quickly. If on you your public it. machines, maybe what I would suggest is uninstall it from one or two, see if people freak out, you can always reinstall mm -hmm. it, yeah. that sort of thing. However, what you can also do, if you, if you don't want to uninstall it, but you want to check to make sure you kind of have solve some of the immediate problems, you can go to isjavaexploitable.com, which I'm showing here, and we, we've, we'll we put in the show notes. And basically it will test your, the current version of Java on your machine to see if you are up to date and if some of the known holes have pl are plugged. 
The problem is, is people are saying that there are even holes that haven't been plugged yet, even if you are up to date. This is why we're kind of leaning towards the uninstall it unless you need it sort of situation. And you can, you can search Google for like Java exploits and things like that, and you can find tons of news, a little more uh, technical detail if you're interested in that. The other thing that I just heard about yesterday, this is not security related, and it's just very different. Amazon, as many of our listeners may know, has been doing cloud storage for quite a while. Mm -hmm. um, it costs, it's reasonably priced, but they've started a new service called Amazon Glacier. And it's designed for people who need to or want to store stuff in the cloud, but they don't need immediate access to it. So like you complete a complete and total backup image of your computer and it's a big giant file, you store it there. And what they're saying is, is that the retrieval time on this, this, what you store there is like three to five hours. You can't just log into a website and say, give me my files back. You have to log in and say, I want my files back, and they'll get back to you eventually. But the point being, if you look right here, as little as one cent per gigabyte per month storage charge, which is a phenomenally low dollar amount. Um, so I just want to put that out there as kind of a possible option if, you know, long-term storage is something libraries and archives do this might be a cost-effective place to put your archival content. I'm just throwing it out there. I yeah. literally learned about this yesterday. So um, it's something I might actually start considering for my, uh, you know, long-term backups and things like that myself. So um, just kind of an interesting option I want to point people to. Okay. So um, that's my news for the month at this point. Uh, I've been on the road a lot, so yeah. it, you kind of live in a news vacuum at that point. But, Sure. So, Krista Woods okay. and the Gum Compass Live page, I will hand it back to you. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Michael and Aaron, for joining us this week. Um, as I said, the show was recorded, so it will be available later today, maybe tomorrow. Um, By the end of the week. To, yeah. <laughs> um, for you to watch if you need to, or to share with any of your colleagues who weren't able to join us this morning. Um, and I hope you'll join us next week. Go back to the main page. Oh, I'm on the archive page. I'm sorry. Um, yeah. So this is the Income Live website. Yes, so you can go there and um, see our archive sessions, everything that we have here on the website. Also, please do, you can see here, like us on Facebook. We do have a Facebook page where we do post um, any announcements of our shows, when they are going to be happening, when the recordings are up. Um, we'll all be posted up there so you can keep in touch with us there. And I hope you join us next week when our topic is the, um, the 2012 One Book, One Nebraska title, which is um, I Am a Man, Chief Standing Bear's Journey for Justice. That's the book that we're reading statewide in Nebraska um, for is those One Book, One Town type things. We have One Book, One Nebraska. And um, we'll be talking about that next week. Uh, the author of the book, Joe Starita, will be here with us. So that's exciting. Cool. We'll have him actually here on Encompass Live with us. Um, and we'll be talking about the finalists for next year's One Book, One Nebraska that you can see here, and um, which will be announced on November 3rd at the Celebration of Nebraska Books here in Lincoln. So um, we'll be talking about those ahead of time so you can maybe think ahead to what might be the book for next time. So hope you'll join us for that next week. Um, other than that, we are good to go. I don't see any final questions or urgent issues. So we'll wrap it up and say thank you very much, and we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye-bye.